month, NASM is giving you free courses. That's right, free courses each month just for being part of the NASM family. Learn about everything ranging from nutrition to strength, weight loss to stress relief, and everything in between. Click the link in the bio for information and to claim your free course before they're gone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Regional Master Instructor Marty Miller with my fellow Regional Master Instructor, Miss Wendy Batts. Wendy, how are you? I'm just living a dream. How are you? Awesome. Well, let's get right to it. We've got a special guest this week. We've got Dr. Kyle Stull, who is a content development manager for NASM. So we are going to have a Q&A roundtable on flexibility techniques. Kyle, welcome to this week's Master Instructor Roundtable. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited about this. And if you know Kyle, he's very excited. You can tell. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, you know, Kyle, thanks for, for joining in. Um, today, I think, is going to be a little, little different just because, you know, there are so many different types of stretching um, components that we can do. And I know within NASM, we talk about a variety. And um, so we're lucky to have you on because I know that you're also an author of a book when it came to foam rolling. So, you know, you're kind of a big deal in my book. So I um, feel, feel very privileged to have you here. Um, but uh, I mean, I'll go ahead and kick it off if you guys are good with that. And I think kind of the, the first question that I know I get a lot um, and I'm sure, you know, you guys do as well. But, you know, there's so many different varieties of stretching. And we talk a lot about static stretching. We talk a lot about active stretching and the dynamic. And then, you know, there are some questions that people talk about uh, about assisted stretching. So, you know, um, you know, I guess I'll start with Marty. Marty, when you talk about static stretching, you know, technically, what is it? Like, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. So, you know, static stretching is a fundamental stretching technique that we want to utilize when we're looking to change shorten or chronically shorten tissue and restore it back to its normal resting length. So I know a lot of times people think static stretching is bad and they think that it's not useful and that it, it increases the chance of injury. And I always say, you know, thank goodness we have static stretching or we would never be able to change improper postures. But again, it's a very specific type of stretching that you're going to within the five kinetic chain checkpoints within the normal bounds of the biomechanics and the range of motion the joint has without compensation, you're going to hold that stretch for 30 seconds or longer because you want to elicit a certain response within the muscle where it's ready to say, okay, I'm going to lengthen and I'm going to calm down a little bit and allow more range of motion in the joint. Now, when you go back to the science of, we're not going to hear and go as deep in every type of stretching science, it's in the book, it's in the content is you utilize this for very specific phase of training on very specific muscles that your assessment tells you are chronically shortened. But back to my original statement, thank goodness we have a tool in our flexibility continuum that can change the length of chronically shortened tissue, or we would just be, you know, all the time facing that, you know, somebody will never be able to change their posture. So that's where we use static stretching. That's the use of it. And then it's on a continuum. Once we change that length, then we can look at the other phases of training and the other forms of stretching because static may not be appropriate anymore. That's right. Well, then I think the warm up, cool down. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> right. And then, you know, so when you said that, I think it's important, you know, it's really based off of the assessment and when we do that. And then, of course, when we know that someone's ready to continue on, we do a reassessment. We see that maybe some of the compensations have cleaned up. And we're getting better, you know, better movement quality. Um, and so I guess, Kyle, if I were to ask you, you know, when, when NASM talks about active stretching, you know, back in the day, we called it active isolated, but now we don't call it that anymore, where it's just active stretching, call it what it is. Can you kind of tell us just a quick definition recap of what active stretching is? Yeah, definitely. So active stretching, the, the term active, that means that you're going to be a bit more of an active participant uh, in the flexibility technique. And you're going to use muscle contractions to help uh, elicit the stretch to help improve the stretch. So if we go back to, to static stretching, uh, you know, one of the mechanism, mechanisms that, that 
allow static stretching to work is more autogenic inhibition. And, and we probably know that as, you know, being a, a, essentially a reflex in the, in the nervous system. Whenever we get to active stretching, here we're going to use more of uh, the mechanism of reciprocal inhibition. So we're going to actively contract the uh, antagonist, so the opposite muscle of what it is we're trying to stretch. And uh, via reciprocal inhibition, that's going to help further reduce the activity in that opposing muscle. The one we're trying to stretch, and that's going to help us improve the, the length of that, that tissue. So the way we would do that is taking a muscle to the first point of tension. We would contract that, uh, again, contract the antagonist. Uh, there, there's various times you can contract it. You know, one to two seconds can can help, but we can also do two to four seconds in that contraction, three to five seconds in that contraction. Um, and then we would uh, relax the muscle and then go back into that stretch again. So we're more so moving through that range of motion and again, actively contracting the antagonist. And we would, uh, again, since it works through a different mechanism, that is a, a flexibility technique that's more appropriate in the strength level of the OPT model. We're not going to get some of those same, uh, some of the same reductions in the the power production of the muscle again via that mechanism that we're using. So we can pr perform that in the strength level before we perform, uh, you know, strength techniques or you know, use that muscle for exercise. Awesome. Well, make it sound all technical, but I like it. <laughs> And then it's going to bring us um, into obviously dynamic. And so when we talk about dynamic stretching, I mean, we usually utilize that in the past only in phase five. However, um, you know, based on research and based on, you know, quality of movement, if you feel like dynamic stretching is appropriate for your clients in any of the phases and that they can actually do it um, with good movement quality, then, you know, then we can perform them actually in any phase, especially if it's before activity, because we're going to get a better rate, um, you know, or uh, we're going to see better results if somebody does dynamic and then goes into something like, you know, plays a sport or does soccer or runs or something like that. So when we're talking about dynamic stretching, we're really trying to do a type of exercise. So let's say a lunge and you're actually lunging down, trying to get good sensibility in the hip flexors as well as going through looking for those parallel lines, getting good quad and glute activation on the opposing side that, of the leg that's forward. And so we're working full, through the full available range of motion of that joint. And so obviously if we have good, good range of motion from static stretching, meaning we stretch the muscles that were shown to be overactive, we've gone into some reciprocal inhibition, as Kyle said, meaning we've got our joints playing nicely with one another, then it allows us more ability to move in some of the exercises that we do with a greater range of motion, which is going to lead to better movement as well as power production long term. And so those are the three that NASM discusses most. And those are the ones that you're going to commonly see in the CPT textbook. Um, but we brought Kyle here today because there's one that we're actually bringing into NASM. And I want, you know, we're extremely excited to have him here because he's going to talk to us a little bit about partner assisted stretching. And so, Kyle, can you kind of tell everyone what is partner assist assisted stretching and, and what's, I mean, besides, besides just having a pal to stretch you, like there's got to be a little more to that. <laughs> Um, no, that's it. You just bring a buddy in and uh, there it is. Just stretch a few things that feel tight. Um, no, so partner assisted stretching, as the name implies, is you're hopefully using somebody that's been trained to, to help stretch. Um, and it's helping to guide through the motion. So we find it to be a little bit uh, you know, more uh, effective in some cases because you are getting that assistance of, uh, you know, from, from a person. One of the things that is often uh, kind of misunderstood is we would think that, well, you have that partner there so they can push a little bit harder, so they can go a little bit deeper. So you can try to, you know, force uh, more range of motion. That's not necessarily the case. You know, what we can do with the, uh, one of the big things of using a, the, the assistance uh, of a partner is making sure we're getting the right joint angles, making sure we can target, or it helps to target uh, certain muscles. It helps to make sure that we're in the right position to really, you know, increase the, the effectiveness of the stretching. And uh, through partner assisted stretching, or whenever we look at partner assisted stretching, we can still use very similar types of techniques as that active, I'm sorry, the, the static 
the active and the dynamic. Um, you know, static stretching, as we talked about, you would take to that first point of tension. And again, uh, you know, a partner helping you, they would help guide that motion. You would hold in that position for 30 or so seconds. Active stretching, again, it's just a simple act of uh, helping that person move through the range of motion. One of the, one of the ways we can change up active stretching though with using a partner is uh, using some contract relax or some PNF stretching. So, or some neuromuscular stretching, depends on which name we want to, to use there. So with that, what we would do is, you know, take a joint again to that first point of tension, and then we would have the person uh, contract the muscle we're trying to target. So in a hamstring stretch, they would contract the hamstring. And then we would hold that for a period of time, relax, and then we could contract the opposite muscle so the quadriceps and a hamstring stretch, and again, take to that next point of tension, we would hold there for 30 seconds. There's, of course, a lot of different ways to, to use neuromuscular stretching. That's just one basic example. And then even to more of a dynamic approach. Now, the dynamic stretching, whenever we're doing a, a partner-assisted stretch, is going to be different. Most of the time in a partner-assisted stretching environment, the person is either on a stretch table or the floor or something similar. One of the ways we can make the, the stretches a bit more dynamic is, is by using a continual motion. So a continual movement, taking the joint in and out or taking the muscle, uh, you know, in and out of that, that stretch and then relaxing and moving through various uh, joint positions. And it's almost like a sort of like a, a flowing type of emotion as we move through the joint. So we can take that partner assisted stretching and we can, we can fit it into all aspects of the model, just like we do the uh, the self stretching. Awesome. So, Marty, do you use partner assisted stretching with your clients? I, I have. Uh, you know, coming from uh, athletic training background, this was stuff that we would study in our undergraduate and graduate work. So, all those terms that Kyle just used with the, you know contract, relax, and the different techniques, you know, because we were able to elicit just uh, better responses. But the key point, and then you know, Kyle, I'll throw you a question: is one of the things where as an athletic training student we felt very comfortable is we were you know really studied the available range of motion we knew exactly how far a joint could go it's not about how far i can take it it's how far i can go into the range of motion without compensation knowing where the maximal range of motion is as well so as we you know bring this now into the fitness industry which i think is awesome can you talk maybe about scope of practice a little bit? Because Wendy and I have always talked about know your scope of practice and then how, you know, the people that will go through this start to understand, as you even mentioned, where too much is too much, that there is a certain range we want to work within and not go too much. Yeah, for sure. And uh, starting off with uh, the scope of practice, the scope of practice regarding assisted stretching has always been, or what I was told years ago, uh, has always been a great area. And one of the things we always need to be aware of is as a fitness professional, if our hands are on the client and they're injured, they could hold us liable. And that is anything. It's whether you're, you're stretching, if you're cueing a muscle, if somebody's doing uh, bicep curls in the squat rack or wherever you do them, do it. If you provide a kinesthetic cue to the bicep or whatever, and they end up getting injured, they could still hold you liable because your hands were on them. So that's one of the things is they can hold you liable anyway because you were supposed to be there guiding and protecting them. So that's one of the things where anytime you touch the client, liability always goes up. However, and I encourage everybody to make sure you uh, review the laws of your state, you know, uh, seek out an attorney to help learn some of these things. If you're working in a health club, make sure that you speak to the health club to be sure that, that they approve it. Um, but assisted stretching is within scope of practice. We just have to be very careful. We have to be aware. We have to receive consent. We have to make sure that, you know, the client understands what's happening. Um, and that's regarding scope of practice. You know, there's no specific law saying that a fitness professional cannot perform assisted stretching. And some of the most successful health clubs in the industry already teach assisted stretching and they've integrated it into their program for uh, at least a decade that I'm aware of, probably closer to, to 20 years, if not longer. So that's the scope of practice. Now, the, one of the ways you can make sure that you're always, you're not going to injure a client, just like you said, Marty, making sure you understand joint range of motion. How far can a joint go? What's too far? What's, you know, what is the, what is the available range of motion? But one of the other big things too is learning to 
to understand tissue responses. And now it doesn't take, you know, a highly trained massage therapist to understand what a tissue tissue response is. Whenever we're performing assisted stretching on clients, we want to take to that very first point of tension. We're not looking for pain. We're not trying to elicit any discomfort. We take to that very first resistance barrier, and that's going to be the range of motion that we work. And a lot of times you have those clients where they think it should hurt. Somebody stretched them in the past and, and that hurt. So this should hurt. And we need to sort of, uh, you know, change, change that thought process to where, again, you know, less is more. So less, uh, you know, less tension, less pain, less discomfort. That's going to get us a better response. And what we'll notice is as we're moving through something like an active stretch, in that session, you will slowly start to increase that, that range of motion. Um, one of the big things we see as far as, uh, you know, improving flexibility in the short term anyway, is that, that a little bit of that stretch tolerance, but a little bit of that uh, just relaxing, you know, the client starting to relax, starting to become more comfortable. And that, again, following that less is more approach, you know, uh, not inducing any sort of a pain, we can get really quick tissue responses. I'm not sure if that was very clear. Very crystal clear. Yeah, I think it's good. And I, and I use I use assisted partner, you know, stretching with with basically all of my clients. However, I do hold a license to touch, if you will, within my state. And I know that it was a big question. So thanks for, for covering that. I Meaning, can I or can I not? However, I think if you guys, you know, are walking into any of these fitness, you know, um, gyms now, you're going to see trainers stretching people. And so I think this is another really cool thing about NASM is, you know, people are already doing it. And yeah. so because people are already doing it, if you're not sure exactly how to do it, then, you know, one of the, the new courses that NASM is getting ready to launch, actually, I think today um, is, you know, is, is a course that's going to help teach you and instruct you in, in your positioning and, and kind of what to feel and what not to feel and what it should look like. Um, you know, and it's going to be one of the newest courses. And Kyle, I know that you were, a, you know, a big part of this course. And that's another exciting reason to have you on. But can you kind of talk to us a little bit? What is it called? What is it like? What's it about? And what will yeah. what will people get out of it? Yeah. And I, I hope it's a, can I go back and touch on one more thing? The scope sure. of practice you were talking yes. about to touch you know one of the things to keep in mind is w whether you go through our uh, stretching and flexibility coaching course or not anytime you're in a stretch don't as a fitness professional don't ever feel like you can you know go in there and start massaging a muscle anytime you start to try to get in there and manipulate the tissue that's where you're crossing the line so all we're doing is you know going through these these stretching techniques um, the way they're taught you know following the guidance but don't ever think you need to get in there and you know rub on the quad or anything that's where you do start to to cross the line regarding scope of practice um, anyway yes so the stretching and flexibility coaching course so this is a course that is uh, it's very practical application based and uh, for that partner assisted stretching since it is new to many fitness professionals uh, we've done a great job of getting tons of application videos in there so with our videos we did three different camera angles to make sure we can can teach fitness professionals exactly where they should place their hands exactly the the uh, the joint angle they need to take to stretch whatever muscle they're trying to stretch. So we try to do a really good job of showing that visually. This is exactly how it's going to look. This is exactly how you're going to perform it. And in this, we do cover all three of those different types of techniques. So we teach a, you know, a hands-on static stretch, a hands-on neuromuscular stretching technique, and then we do a hands-on, you know, kind of a dynamic approach, but keeping in mind it doesn't fit the typical definition of dynamic stretching, more of a, uh, we call it a perpetual movement, it's good movement because it's a continuous motion of the joint to slowly increase that that range of motion. So, um, so that's how we teach it in the course, and like you were saying, that's one of the ways you can, you know, definitely increase the safety when you're working with your clients is following the techniques that we teach in this course. A big part of that too being learning those tissue responses and uh, the, the no pain thing. The no pain, no discomfort. We're just taking that first point of tension. That's going to be where we work as a fitness professional and uh, it'll get us uh, great results. Awesome. So no pain, no rubbing. I got it. No pain, um, no pain and no rubbing. <laughs> 
So, uh, and Marty, I'm sorry, I keep kind of taking over, but I've got these no. questions. And so you can butt in next time, I promise. But so with, with this new like partner assisted, you know, stretching, I know it's just another, another form, but can like, so are you, do you suggest, I mean, with this course, when people take it and they start to become more familiar with this type of, you know, technique and, and using it with their clients, how does that kind of integrate with, you know, for CPTs or the CES or even the PES? Like, how do you know, like, am I supposed to just have them static stretch partner or, or can it just be mixed up? Like, how do you, how do we teach people when to use it? Um, the, well, I suggest you use, you know, partner assistive stretching anytime you have a, uh, a session. So you start the session off by having the client foam roll. We still want to use the self myofascial rolling techniques. Um, cause we know that helps prepare the tissue to get a better response, but the client starts off doing that. And then we can get them up on a stretching table to, to go through, uh, some of the assisted stretching. Now we would still follow that same continuum. You know, if your client demonstrates muscle imbalances, ideally we would start off with a static stretch, but then, you know, again, according to the research, what I would want to do is we can do the assisted static stretching on the table, make sure we're improving that range of motion. And then we get them up and we can take them through a few dynamic movements as long as they can control it, uh, demonstrate perfect form. And then we could take them into a training session. We can even end the session with a few, you know, partner assisted uh, static stretches. In my opinion, that increases the value of the fitness professional because we're not just saying, uh, all right, Mrs. Jones, go over there and, and do your static stretches the way you know you're supposed to do them. Um, or, you know, even if we're coaching that static stretch, again, most of the time fitness professionals are over there, uh, you know, talking to their clients, which is not a bad thing, you know, coaching them into good form. Hopefully they're asking about their nutrition. They're doing this, they're doing that. But to me, it just increases the value whenever you're able to your value, whenever you're able to get the client on the table, take them through these specific stretches, um, you know, could be two, three, four, five muscle groups, and then get them up and, and go to their session. We do not want to devalue the purpose of uh, self stretching though. Like there is a huge benefit to being an active participant in your own goals, whatever it is. So that self stretching is what we would do use as homework. It's what we would use whenever they're uh, working out on their own. It's what we would use, you know, various times throughout the week. But whenever they have a session with you, I would do the assisted stretching. We also have the, the option of if a client trained too hard or if they had a really stressful day and they, they don't feel like working out, which I know we've all had those clients, instead of saying, nope, we're going to push through this because this is going to get you to your goals, what we could do is just schedule a little bit longer assisted stretching uh, session. So that way we don't lose the session. We don't have to cancel the session. We can get them on the table. We can take them through a total body group team, they're going to feel better. And then, you know, maybe we can reschedule their training session for the next day. Awesome. So Kyle, I have a couple of questions. I'll kind of summarize some of it. So I think I know the answer, but you know, it's always good to kind of throw this out there. So I have seen some people who do assisted stretching and they, everybody has the same routine. If you, if you watched, it's just the same cookie cutter approach to everything. How do we tie that into the assessments to know exactly what, targeting, you know, what muscles we should target or how we do that with the ass assessments in, in the back of our mind, of course. Uh, it's it's the same approach. We would take the, the same assessments in the stretching and flexibility coaching course. We use the, the same assessment approach with the overhead squat um, and we would identify the muscles that are short and overactive or however, however, whatever we want to label them. And those are the muscles that we would target in the stretching session. So that stretching session could just be focusing on two to three muscle groups. Um, however, I do want to the not necessarily downplay more of a total body type of a program, but what we would do here is focus more on, you know, what you'll learn in the course, um, that continuous flow, that dynamic type of an approach to the, to the partner assisted stretching. So there's nothing wrong with doing a total body program with a client following those techniques because we're really just moving in and out of the joint. You know, we're not necessarily trying to, uh, you know, improve muscle imbalances at that point per se. It's more of just moving the joint, moving the tissues, you know, getting the, the body to, to moving basically. So still following that same assessment approach. However, we do teach a program uh, for that time. If you just need, you know, 10 quick stretches for your client and we would be following more of that continuous type of a thing, not necessarily doing the static stretching, trying to, to improve the muscle imbalances. Awesome. If that makes so sense. 
Yeah, if I can answer a quick follow up. So the key point there is that when somebody is doing total body throughout the course, you'll talk about what tends to be overactive and what maybe needs a little more focus on that static, depending what phase of training they're in. But if you're yeah. going in the total body, how you'll know how to create that flow. So it's not just all static potentially. Right. Exactly. Awesome. Wendy, back there. to you. Yeah, no, I mean, I find that interesting because, you know, again, you know, the course I have not taken it. So I was super excited to see that it's coming out. I mean, I'm, I'm not done with it. I shouldn't say I haven't taken it. I'm not done with it. Um, so, so just to recap what you're saying, Kyle, like, so basically when we're doing partner assisted, it's not always just like phase one doing the static approach. It's not adding in more of the reciprocal inhibition, the contract, relax, and the strength phases and just more of the dynamic continuous flow in phase five. So just so we're all clear here, you're saying that we could do kind of the continuous, even in phase one, just because we're working on just joint movement patterns. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. And one of the things we, we try to reiterate in this course too, is people are going to respond to the different techniques differently almost every day. So you may have a client that responds better to the static stretching on Monday, but for some reason they respond better to the active stretching on, on Wednesday. Now, I'm not saying that whenever I say respond better, I don't mean they say that they don't like the static stretching so they don't want to do it. It's more of you can feel it in the tissue response. You can see the improvements in range of motion. So we have these different techniques and we really encourage the fitness professional to figure out what is the client responding better to and using a variety of techniques every day if you need to. So it's, it's trying the static, trying the active, trying that continuous movement and seeing like, how are they responding? How is the joint improving? Um, you know, what is the, the client's uh, facial expression? Like, are they relaxed? Are they enjoying it? Um, so we really want to encourage the, the integration of the techniques with all sessions. Love it. Awesome. Yeah. New approaches, more tools in our toolbox. I, I dig yeah. it. And that's, Kyle, I know one question that's going to come up is, can you talk about the CEUs? That's always, people are always passionate about their CEUs. You know yes, there are CEUs in this course. <laughs> that's all you got for me? You're not going to tell me how many? I, I, I forgot. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> That's fair. You know what? Just go. We can find it all under nasm.org, and all the the um, information is definitely there. But I mean, you know, was, I, oh, go ahead. I mean, it was a little bit of a, dis a discussion, and we talked about different things, and then it it I forgot what we decided. So, but this this is an in depth course. This isn't like a little bonus module type thing. I mean, this is an extensive is. course. It is an in-depth course. We estimate that each module, and there's nine different modules or nine different chapters, we we estimate that each chapter is going to take at least two hours. So it, it's, uh, you know, a pretty extensive course. You know, one of the things to talk about or that I would like to add to, um, we don't go through here and just re regurgitate <laughs> the, the same science that we talk about in CPT, CES, and PES. So we, you know, we, in, we begin this course um, thinking that the client is going to have a, a base understanding of flexibility. So we do recommend it for recommend that somebody have at least the CPT. And then from there, we start to build upon that foundational knowledge. So one of the things that I'm really excited about on this course is the introduction of uh, fascia, which is not an introduction of fascia, but this course is going to talk more about fascia than any of our other courses. And I really think that the, we, we go more in depth in fascia in this, this particular course than any other course that's available to fitness professionals in, in, you know, based on what I know anyway, maybe there's something out there that I'm not familiar of, with, but that's one of those things too, getting into some of the fascia science, how does fascia respond? What is the influence of fascia on our flexibility? And that last uh, stretching technique that we talk about that continuous, continuous movement, you know, that was, um, introduced to us by fascial experts and that was their approach is this is really going to be a fascial focused type of a stretching technique but understanding that everything is is related so we're not just fat focusing on the fascia it's all of it but it's a it is a, a fascia focused technique for lack of a better term 
So, so just um, for clarity, you know, Kyle, you know, when you're talking about fascia, you know, fascia and, and everything, you know, we do talk about it a little bit in the CPT. Obviously, it's talked about a little bit in the CES. But can you kind of give us a little bit more of a, a definition or how you would explain what, like, when we're talking about this, like, what exactly are we talking about? Like, is it? Can you just go a little bit into like what when you're talking about fascia, like what you mean? Um, fascia. So the the uh, the connective tissue that is oftentimes not talked about, but it's it's what connects everything to everything, right? So it is a uh, you know layers of tissue that penetrate throughout the body, and they really they uh, they encapsulate the uh, the bones, the vessels in between the muscle fibers. So it's really um, everything. You know, it helps uh, it helps provide a lot of form and support as well. So that when we talk about fascia, that's really what we're talking about. There is just that additional uh, connective tissue that's in between everything, and the you know the science on it is emerging. So I, I hesitate to say that there is a hard science that really defines what fascia is and its specific role in movement and flexibility and all those type of things. But it is emerging. There is uh, information growing. So we've included a lot of that in this course. Um, and again, I think it's one of those where most fitness professionals won't be able to read this research unless they have uh, you know, a membership to the the Journal of Body Work and Movement Therapies or some other type of a manual techniques journal. So I'm really excited to be able to introduce that to fitness professionals. Awesome. That sounds like exciting stuff. And I think is, you know, the key thing is NASM is dedicated to looking at all the current research. And when there's a gap in knowledge, either adding it to like what we have done, we've added some things to both the CES and the CPT, but also coming out with this new credential. So if I'm not mistaken, this is a credential after someone finishes the course and exam, they could then use those, the CFC after their name. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. So they can really focus in on a business model of that as well. There's people like to specialize in corrective. There's some people like to do the entire continuum. But for somebody that's really passionate about maybe the hands-on, this could be something that they may become a true specialist in. They can for sure, and I hope they do that. You know, that was one of the one of the purposes of this course is, it, like I said earlier, adding you know being able to add another service, being able to to build your business flexibility. I mean, it's always been a big thing, but it seems like there's more of the uh, more of the the stretching focused studios and boutiques out there, or at least they were emerging. Uh, a year and a half ago. I think some of them are still growing. Um, but, you know, it's becoming a really big business. People are starting to become more focused on their flexibility and how they feel and how they move, you know, not just concerned with, with how they uh, look. And as an SFC or a stretching and flexibility coach, I think you can add that additional service into uh, into your programs and be able to do something that a lot of other, you know, fitness professionals in your your gym or health club aren't able to do yet until they see you doing it and they decide that they want to take the course as well. No, that's exciting stuff. Well, yeah, I know I personally do that. I mean, Kyle, you mentioned, you know, you've got some and, and I work a lot with athletes. And so when we have like a super hard workout, if they want to come back to back, I mean, oftentimes, you know, I'll say, let's come in, you know, today's your, you know, I call it their spa day, if you will. But I mean, I'll spend a lot of time, you know, using, you know, like a, a hypervolt or some kind of like handheld device, you know, to try to, to try to, um, you know, relax the muscles a little bit. And then I do this type of stretching and I can make it almost an hour session and charge for it. And they feel better. They move better. They look better. It's a, it's a really good quote recovery day. However, we're still being connected and it's another service where I'm yeah. getting paid. So on a business standpoint, it's phenomenal because I can do their workout to whatever level they are based on, you know, obviously their, their assessment and where they are, where they need to be before they go and, you know, off into their season. But then it's also great for, you know, my clients too, who never stretch on their own. Cause we know that if we tell someone to stretch at home or we tell somebody, here's your homework, or before you come in, I want to see this, or before you leave, go stretch. Well, most of them, you know, they, they go grab water and then run into the, the, you know, to the locker room and shower and then try to sneak out because they, they don't have quote time to stretch. Yeah. So to your point, five or 10 minutes before five or 10 minutes after to really get, you know, better range of motion before they start their workout. And then again, after their workout or doing it as a complete session, I think is a, it's a huge, huge added benefit to a, you know, on a business side of the game. Yeah. For sure. And I would look at too, um, 
you know, thinking of doing like focusing on uh, recovery or recovery day or just recovery in general. So SFC and then also looking at that nutrition component too, right? So if you have the, uh, the SFC, the CNC, you're able to provide these services you know, nutrition is going to play a huge role in everything. We know that. But then you can think to, uh, you know, how do you maximize the time in between sessions? How do you maximize that that recovery, that regeneration, whatever we call it? You know, combining credentials like that, uh, again, will just set the fitness professional apart from most other people in their facility. Yeah. And one of the things I've noticed, uh, Kyle, Wendy, you know, you have some people that are really go-getters that they can follow workout on their own. So they yeah. may not need to train with you all the time. Maybe it's just a check in and a reassessment. But you know, even as much as I know how to stretch myself, it's never the same as if I can get with somebody that truly now can, especially certain parts of the body, can take. Yeah. You know, I get to relax. I get to totally let them do the work in a sense. I get all the benefits. But part of it is when I'm stretching myself, something's contracting while I'm trying to relax something else. And sometimes, yeah. depending on your mobility, your flexibility yourself limiting but being up on the table and letting somebody else truly be in control i know one it's just kind of mentally relaxing for me sure. but i'm also going to get that extra little bit that on certain body parts i can never get that same type of response on myself yeah yeah for sure and i think that you know talking about the relaxing you know that's that's key in my opinion, both before and after the workout. You know, a lot of times people think that pre-workout, you need to come in all jazzed up on your your uh, your pre-workout and listen to your angry music, but that could, you know, potentially take away from your focus of the training. So especially if we're doing something that's that's focused, uh, you know, a high skill level day or something, taking a few minutes before a session to actually relax and try to get mentally prepared for the session will improve the training. Um, looking at using it as form of a, a form of recovery too, we know that a lot of clients don't necessarily like exercise, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. you know, that's biologically we're wired to not love exercise. So if they if they have something like a few minutes of assisted stretching again, where they can relax and actually enjoy the last ten minutes of the session, you know that can be motivation to to make sure that they keep coming back to their sessions. So you can think about that from, from different perspectives, but take, having that opportunity to relax um, is of huge value for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. And, you know, I'm excited. I just started the content myself. So again, I'm, I'm you know, definitely focused on getting through the content. I'm excited to see the new research. You know, I've, I've studied these techniques in the past, but that was on, you know, science, you know, they weren't wrong, but obviously now we'll have a better understanding of the fascial system. So I'm excited to go through that. And you know, it's one of those things that, as myself, I'm always trying to build up my skill set, but I know NASM's committed that for everybody so that way they can, you know, continue on in a nice progressive career. So exciting stuff coming. Yeah, for sure. Yes. And one thing too, I know that you guys might have seen it on the on the lower banner there, but to answer the question, it is 1.6 CEUs that you will get for taking this course. And, um, you know, and, and just to also piggyback off of what Kyle said, I think it's important, like you said, you know, the, the five or 10 minutes beforehand, like to mentally prepare, but on a rapport builder, I think that's phenomenal as well, because when you're working with someone and you've got the five or 10 minutes and it's just you focusing on your client, you know, you can also talk to them about their day. You can see if they, you know, ate before they came, what their day was like, what their stress level may be. So on a programming standpoint, you know if there needs to automatically be changes of maybe some sort of regression or, you know what, maybe they had an amazing day, their flexibility looks incredible that day. And maybe it's a day, you know what, let's, let's see if we can do an assessment, move you up a phase or something. I mean, so it's a good way to really talk to your client, build that rapport. And, and as to your point, after, you know, the 40 minutes or whatever of that intense workout where they don't like you, then they like you again before they leave. So to your point, they come back and then they feel like they can't live without you. So I think that is a huge, huge win as a trainer because me spending that one-on-one -on -one time with them, um, you know, it's been a huge benefit because my clients keep coming back, even though I know they can do this stuff on their own. Yeah. And we do talk a lot about communication in the course. So I'm glad you you brought that up. Like communication, that rapport building, that's a big part of it. Um, and a lot of that, you know, it falls into that, you know, scope of practice and boundaries. What do you talk about as you're there stretching your client? Uh, but just communication, rapport building, you know, learning to, uh, to to ask your client those questions during that stretching is all uh, a part of the SFC course. So. Amazing stuff. 
It is. Well, Kyle, I know we've been taking up a ton of your time, but you know, just if you had to say, you know, like what would be your key takeaways for, for this webinar? Like what do, what should people do? What do you think they should take away from, from everything that we've talked about today? Um, what should they take away from everything we talked about today? <laughs> well, hopefully they are, uh, they have become interested in the stretching and flexibility coaching course, and they look into that. Uh, that's one thing that I hope they take away. I hope they take away the importance of the integration of different types of techniques. I think a lot of times people, um, you know, read our text, they read our information, and they get in their head this very strict linear progression in everything that we teach. And a lot of times that's because we have to present things in a textbook and it may be difficult uh, to communicate it. But start to think more of the, the integrated type of use of flexibility. So going back to what Marty said about, you know, static stretching. Well, you know, even if a client's in phase one with muscle imbalances, we can do static stretching and then follow that up with some dynamic stretching as long as they can control it. And, you know, research, research has shown that that static stretching can help improve the movement patterns. Following it up by dynamic stretching is going to help mitigate any of the force reduction that maybe is caused by the static stretching. So we can, we can integrate those. The same thing in phase five. You know, there's nothing wrong with performing static stretching prior to a phase five exercise if they have, uh, you know, what problematic calves or, you know, hip flexors that keep tightening up. Some static stretching prior to the dynamic stretching prior to that phase five workout will work perfectly fine. So start to integrate the different types of techniques. Um, one of the last things I hope people kind of take away from this, even though we didn't really go into to detail, is start start trying to expand your mind and, and uh, think about fascia. Think about the different uh, the different roles that fascia may play. Try to dig into some of that research. Like I said, it's not necessarily a hard science yet, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, but it, it's, it's truly fascinating. And keeping in mind that it's just one of the many types of tissues that we have in the body. So Oftentimes people are, uh, you know, fascia, fascia, fascia all the time. And then you have people that still say fascia is not really anything. Just again, that integration, it does play an important role in how we feel and how we move. So start to learn more about it. Uh, you know, hopefully hearing just a, a tad bit about it in this webinar uh, makes the fitness professional excited to try to do a little bit more research on their own. Awesome. Now, Kyle, we can't thank you enough because I know uh, we know your background and we know the expertise you bring to NASM, but also with this course. So I know Wendy and I are both excited to get through it ourselves and be students again, and then hopefully be able to bring that knowledge to our clients and or fellow NASM uh, and certified personal trainers or aspiring personal trainers. So thank you for bringing this course to life with NASM. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit, a little bit about it here on the webinar. Awesome. So Wendy, anything in uh, conclusion before we wrap it up? No, I'm just excited because this is totally different than what NASM normally comes out with. And so I think, you know, offering, you know, a new course, it makes me excited to your point, Kyle, to learn something that, you know, isn't, I, I mean, I feel very comfortable with stretching because I do hold a manual license. I obviously went to school for a lot of what you're talking about, but, you know, obviously I do get, I have a license to rub and to do the things that, that some other people may not. And yeah. so I think, you know, bringing it to, you know, all, all per, you know, personal trainers, as long as they're comfortable. And again, it fits within their state regulations and their, and obviously where they work, because obviously you want to clear all that too. I think just teaching the right movement patterns, the right range of motion and, you know, and what kind of responses they're going to get out of that, like what they should expect once somebody gets yeah. off the table, as well as build communication and business, you know, your business, I think all of it together, I mean, is super exciting. And, you know, plus you get 1.6 CEUs out of it. That's not too shabby either. Um, so I'm super excited. And, and again, I know to Marty's point, you are super busy. And the fact that you're taking the time to, you know, kind of bring this, bring this out for everyone to learn more about before they dive into the material, I think is, um, you know, we're really lucky to have you. So thanks for joining us. Well, good. Well, thank you. I'm not really that busy. <laughs> we gave you the opportunity on camera, to know, but I appreciate your honesty. So, Wendy, as always, it's been a blast. Kyle, thank you for being here. Hope everyone checks out the new course, and we will be back next week as always. So, take care, everybody.